Welcome back to the Wandering Wesley, and this is Chaplain Greg, and uh, we're going through our Walking in the Word series, and if you are enjoying this series, please like on YouTube and subscribe to my channel, and uh, that way we can fix those YouTube logarithms and get this material out to more people. Um, thank you so much for watching. I'm honored that you are enjoying this series and are sticking with it. And if you have any comments, please comment in the comment section. Uh, I reply to all comments. Um, we haven't had very many, uh, but uh, we'd love to hear from you and what your thoughts are about uh, the material that you're reading. So, uh, last week we talked about uh, a sermon in Psalm 136. We're going to leave the Psalms and we're going to move into a major portion of the wisdom literature and that's Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And these three books are very tied together in that they are producing a worldview about who God is and how God works in the world and how humans work in the world. This is all very important because, you know, we... we we don't live a completely spiritual life. We live a physical life. And we, have, we have problems. We have things that happen to us. Um, the book of Job especially deals with, you know, the problem of evil. You know, how do we deal with God's justice, God's sovereignty, and yet evil still happens? Well, the wisdom literature talks a lot about that. So, the word in, in Hebrew for wisdom is chokmah which means wise, skills, wits. It, it's an action word, chokma. Wisdom isn't something that just is. It's something you also do. It's also something you live. Uh, Eastern wisdom or logic difference, is different from Western wisdom or logic in that Western logic uses linear thinking. So let's think of a typical Western argument, um, the Kalam cosmological argument. And, and even though this was done by a, a, an Easterner, a Muslim, um, it's very Western in, in its structure. Um, so it's first part, <clears throat> everything that begins to exist has a cause. The second part, the universe begins to exist. Uh, and then the conclusion, therefore the universe has a cause. Um, William Bennett's uh, argument for good art is another good example of Western uh, philosophy or Western wisdom. <clears throat> One, if we believe that good art, good music, and good books will elevate taste and improve the sensibilities of the young, two, they certainly do, then the conclusion is, then we must also believe that bad music, bad art, and bad books will degrade. Now, I'm not arguing the, any of those points. I'm just showing you the Western, liter Western philosophy, Western wisdom is very linear. It draws a line. Eastern logic is different. Eastern logic uses many different ways to look at the same subject over and over again through poetry, through hyperbole, through metaphor and simile. Uh, you repeat things over and over again, looking at it a little bit different. Uh, and it, you're looking at the same thing in different ways. So the example that I use to explain um, Eastern and Western logic is this. And this is when my son was young. He's now 32. Um, but uh, when he was younger, I'd have to ask him to clean his room. Like most young lads, he would have a very messy room at most times. So I would go to him, and Western logic, which is more what he understands, Leon, Ian, clean your room. I'm telling you because I'm your father, and I have authority over you. And if you clean your room in a certain amount of time, we're going to get ice cream. If then statements causes linear okay if I were appealing to his Hebrew nature if I were to uh, try to explain to him the reasons why he should clean his room in a Hebrew nature I'd do it something like this I was walking and I came upon a room oh the filth 
the dirt. Never have I seen a room as messy as this one. Never has there been in the history of time a room as messy as this one. Legos strewn here and there. Clothes spread from one side to the other. Who, who shall clean this room? How can we overcome the uncleanliness, the filth, the dirt? Ah, my son. The, the product of my loins, the progeny of my youth, my son, he comes, he comes and he, he shall clean, he shall take charge, he shall put Legos away, he shall put toys in toy box, he shall put clothes in hamper, he shall make bed, he is my son. Woe to him, woe greatly if he fails to do said task. Woe to him if he fails his father. The shame I will feel as father that he doesn't clean his room. But alas, he cleans his room and is rewarded with succulence, is, re is rewarded with the fruit of nature of ice cream. That's how, see how I use the whole lot of words to say that and looked at it in many, many different ways. That's how Eastern wisdom works. And as you are reading through the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job, keep that in mind. They're going to say things over and over again, a little bit differently each time. So let's start with Proverbs. So Almost assuredly, Solomon did not write all of Proverbs, but he probably contributed a vast amount. See, the, the, the Solomon wisdom literature was a school or a tradition that was kept up through the exile. <clears throat> and there's lots of different types of Proverbs in there. And we need to know that wisdom is not the law. Okay, these are not commands in Proverbs. We shouldn't see them as commands. Wisdom is a guide. These are guides. We're going to live our best life if we follow the wisdom that's in Proverbs. Proverbs is laying out the best life. And if we follow the law of God and serve God, we are, ex we are exhibiting wisdom. Proverbs are not promises. Uh, they focus on the general rule and not the exception. So how do we split this up? Because Proverbs has a structure. Like all Hebrew books in the Hebrew Bible, Proverbs has a structure. So chapters 1 through 9 are 10 separate speeches from a father to a son. There's also four poems in chapters one through nine. Uh, the poems of Lady Wisdom, and that's chapter one, verses 20 through 33, chapter three, verses 13 through 20, chapter eight, chapter nine, and goodness and justice are the objective realities of Proverbs. Proverbs 1, 7 sets up the tone of the whole book. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge Fools despise wisdom and discipline. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, echoes that when he says, How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway of sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. See how he says the same thing multiple times. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. Fear of the Lord is reverence and humility before God, which is the source of all wisdom. So let's talk about the fear of the Lord. And I think we've mentioned this in the past. The fear of the Lord isn't being frightened or scared or terrified. Although if we were to meet God face to face, I think some of those emotions would come into play. Fear of the Lord is a reverence, is a bowing low, is a humility that I am not God, but he, Yahweh, God, is the source of all morality, not me. And remember, when we're talking about morality, we're going back to the garden, aren't we? Where God set up one moral rule. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
but the humans decided they wanted to do what they wanted to do. They wanted to be like God, even though they already were like God. So God is the source of all morality. God is the source of all wisdom. The wisdom of Proverbs is the way things should be, and it depends on a concept of God's justice. So there are four different elements that we kind of put into this idea of God's justice. When you do the right thing, then good things happen. Hmm. When you do the wrong thing, then bad things happen. When you honor God, you have a good life. If you dishonor God, you have a terrible life. The Proverbs puts out the best of what God's wisdom can be. It doesn't deal with the nuances that maybe Job or Ecclesiastes is going to deal with. So don't read Proverbs as this is the way it absolutely has to be. No, this is the way it can be when we follow Torah, when we follow God's word, when we follow Jesus. Chapters 30 through 31 are poems that reflect the moral character of man and woman. So these poems are wisdom that let us know that God has a way of viewing men and viewing women very specifically. And how men and women treat each other is really important. So that's Proverbs. Um, let's move then to Ecclesiastes. And I'm going to save Joel for last because, uh, uh, Job, I mean, for last, because Job is, is and we're, we're going to spend all of next week on Job. Uh, Job is a tough one. But Ecclesiastes, it's a little dark because while Proverbs is the way things should be, Ecclesiastes gets into how things kind of are. Uh, the author is anonymous. Uh, but he, in, he introduces us to the teacher, or the one who gathers people together. Okay, there's an important word that permeates the book of Ecclesiastes. That's the word havel. Havel, havel. Everything is utterly havel. Havel literally in Hebrew means vapor or smoke or non-existent. Have you ever tried... Uh, when it's a cold day and you breathe and you see your breath to cry and grab it and hold it, you can't. That's Havel. Meaningless is probably, it's the most popular translation, probably not the best, because the author isn't saying that life doesn't have meaning. It's more complicated than we might understand. Um, life is temporary and comes to an end. Uh, it's hard to grasp completely. And, you know, when we, when we breathe on a cold day, we can't hold it. It's there and then it's not. And our lives are kind of like that. We're here for a brief time and then we're not. We live on the memories of our family and friends, but soon they're there and not. So... You know, Ecclesiastes is talking about the things that we hold on to that are chavel, that are vapor, that are disappearing. Um, the meaning and purpose apart from God is chavel. So if you have your faith, hope, and trust in God, then you don't have chavel. You have something that is eternal that is everlasting, that will always be. So I want to read a little bit of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to be looking at uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And um, so if you have ever heard a band called The Birds, uh, they were very famous in the 60s and 70s, they had a song that uh, spoke about this. And here the writer of Ecclesiastes talks about how the times change. 
There is an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under heaven, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to avoid embracing, a time to search and a time to count as loss, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to be silent, a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What a beautiful poem that is. Um, you can see the Hebrew nature of it, where the, the author is talking about sort of the same subject, that there's a time for some things and a time for other things. And he looks at it from so many different positions. Wisdom doesn't always work the way we think it should work. Life is primarily out of our control. That's a tough thing to grasp, isn't it? Life is tough. Life is hard. And um, we should enjoy all the things that give us satisfaction. But these things should not replace God. I love music. One of my deepest passions in my life is music. Um, and sitting down and listening to a piece of music, whether it be uh, Rush's Moving Pictures album, which is one of my favorite albums, or Kansas's Left Overture album, or um, Handel's Messiah, I, I love it. But if music were to become more important than my relationship with God, then it becomes an idol. There's a time for music, and there's a time not for music. Uh, I enjoy good food, as you may tell. And there's a time to enjoy good food. There's a time to eat and enjoy the, you know, what the earth has given us as far as a bounty and the taste and the flavor of good cooking and the effort that people put into that. And then there's a time for fasting. And not everybody in this world is able to enjoy those things. And that's what this, this uh, piece of wisdom literature, this poem is talking about. So Ecclesiastes, really is a, a wonderful book to level set our expectations on life. Um, let me read just one more. And this is uh, Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. And this is how the book ends. When all has been hard, the conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God, keep his commandments, because this is for all humanity. For God will bring every act to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. That's how Ecclesiastes ends. Ecclesiastes is a book which, like I said, level sets our expectations. And uh, as you read through it and reread through it and reread through it again, absorb what the teacher is trying to teach us. So until next week, we're going to go to Job next week. And if you thought Ecclesiastes was a bit of a bummer, well, we're hitting Job. Um, if you like this video, please like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, put your comments in, in the comment section. We'd love to, I'd love to hear from you. I'll uh, respond back to you. Also, uh, send me an email. Mm -hmm.